my great honor to introduce um, this year's Warren Herb Wagner lecture in plant systematics. Um, and in, in the beginning, I'll, I'll give a little background on the uh, seminar series. It was made possible by a generous donation from the Wagner family. And it's been about 15 years in the running now. And um, it highlights basically the latest and greatest uh, research in plant systematics. Um, and the, the seminar is named after uh, Warren Herb Wagner, who was a, a legend in, in botany. And he was a longtime faculty member here from 1951 to uh, 1991. And um, he had a humongous influence on the field of plant systematics. Um, one of his major contributions was the, um, the analytical method to design phylogenetic trees. Um, and, and so, there are methods that are named after him and the, that are still used today. So um, he obtained his PhD at the University of Berkeley, and that's where he met his wife, Florence Wagner, who is a longtime co-conspirator, and you can still find her at the herbarium many days. Um, he was um, elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1985, and among many other awards, he received the Ace Degree Award from the American Society of Plant Taxonomists. And um, I unfortunately never got the opportunity to meet him, but he's notorious for his amazing um, passion in the classroom, and so much so that he taught into his retirement. Um, and his influence on the field is great. He had um, chaired 45 doctoral dissertations, and he sat on over 240 <coughs> doctoral theses while he was here. And so I, I understand that one of his um, sayings was that uh, biology is the study of plants and the things that live off them. <laughs> and, and, and so with that in mind, I think Herb would have actually been very happy that we have someone here finally for the, um, the Wagner Lecture who studies the things that live in such intimate associations with plants, which are the plant endophytes that grow in basically all plant leaves. And so that is um, today's speaker, Dr. Betsy Arnold, who is a professor at uh, University of Arizona in the departments of microbiology and plant pathology and ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, so uh, Betsy is, is mostly focused on endophytic fungi and she really burst onto the scene during her doctoral dissertation where she published uh, two I incredibly important landmark papers. One of them is, uh, is called, Are Tropical Endophytes Hyperdiverse? And the answer to that was, of course, yes. <laughs> and it changed everything we thought about fungal diversity. And with all that diversity in mind, she also showed that there's a, a functional importance to that diversity, which she did very elegantly with um, studies with cacao showing that endophytes basically can protect plants from parasites. Um, and I fir first met Betsy in, uh, when she came to Duke University as a postdoc, and she um, worked with Francois Luzoni and integrated sort of the whole systematics and DNA sequencing into, into her research. And um, she started on the faculty at Arizona in 2005, and she's built um, probably one of the most active um, mycological research laboratories in the world. And that, that research is fully integrated with teaching and outreach. And if you want any ideas about how to do that, you can just sit down with Betsy for a few minutes and you'll get him a lot of great ideas. Um, it's very inspiring. She also wears a curatorial <laughs> hat. She's the director of the Robert Gilbertson uh, Mycological Herbarium there at, at Arizona. And um, well, I'll let her. I'll let her take it over from here. But she's got many discoveries in in in, in her history, and, and one of them is about the symbiosis, which we'll talk about today. So Wonderful. Please join me in welcoming Betsy. Thanks, Tim. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Can everybody hear me in the back? Are we good? 
Um, all right, so I, I just want to um, almost stop crying after such a nice introduction from, from Tim. Um, that was uh, both really generous and, and kind, but also such a nice context um, to remember Herb Wagner um, and his contributions. Uh, as um, many of you may know, I, I um, originated in tropical biology, but ended up uh, moving into a plant systematics lab, actually, for my PhD work. And so I was familiar with Herb's name for a, a long time before I ever had the chance to actually come to Michigan and see some of the plants with which he was so intimately involved. Um, and so the chance to be here today really means a lot to me personally. Um, and I want to thank everyone for the incredible hospitality, um, and especially Tim, for this opportunity. So thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank you all for coming to hear a little bit about fungi today. Um, and I feel that I'm stepping into some large shoes in a few ways, um, in part because you have uh, one of the world's best mycologists here on your faculty, and that is Tim. Um, and so um, I'm really honored by all the kind things that you said. Um, so I thought that I would um, start by uh, reflecting a little bit on uh, my role as a teacher. I really do enjoy teaching, and as one of the aspects of my microbial diversity course, which is my main undergraduate course, I force the students to write term papers in that archaic sort of way that occasionally we still do. Um, and um, as you're reading the 80th or 90th term paper, occasionally the words start to blur together. But sometimes you hit that last paragraph that has a juicy sentence that you almost would have missed. Um, and this was one that I came across. Um, so I'd been reading for days and days. And all of a sudden, at the end of this paper, about really nothing having to do with symbiosis, the student, I think just to see if I was really paying attention, stuck in this sentence that said, not only we are living in the symbiotic renaissance, which gave me pause. I was like, wow, that's really right. And he ended with, dude. <laughs> <laughs> And so as a teacher, I like to think that occasionally I'm imparting knowledge and ideas upon students, but I also benefit greatly from their insights. And I don't know what he was on at the time that inspired this deep thought, but it actually was kind of a thought changer for me. Um, and in thinking about it, what I thought is that I could use that to frame my talk because I actually agree with that. The student got an A um, in part because of this idea. And I thought, boy, what do I know about the Renaissance, right? And I was like, well, I, gosh, I was a, an ecologist as a college student. I don't really know. So I looked up some things online. Um, and I learned that there's actually a lot of great stuff about the Renaissance. There was the beauty of the art. There were the really important turtles um, that I think played a major role. Um, those of you might know the Ninja Turtles. Um, and as I looked at Wikipedia, I thought, OK, probably there are some principles that might apply. And so in thinking about the Renaissance, this was a period in human history where there was a transformation of the field of philosophy in which classical ideas were cast in a new light. Okay? Wikipedia also tells me, this oracle informs me, that this was a time in which the arts were altered through new perspectives, okay, framing and arising from new techniques. And then finally, architecture was transformed by the application of new methods, which changed the landscape itself. Okay? And so as I thought a little bit harder about what this student said, I thought, wow, how remarkable is it that we're living in an age in the study of symbiosis in which these transformations actually are occurring. And as we look back in the historical perspective of symbiosis put forward by de Berry, okay, we now can frame those ideas of two organisms living in close association together with a variety of new tools and new perspectives. Right? We have uh, an increased diversity of scientists studying symbiosis. Right? We have new ways to depict the data that we have. We have new kinds of data that are changing the landscape of the questions themselves. Okay? And so, quite accurately, I think this is the symbiotic renaissance. And we're in a wonderful time to be studying symbioses, not only those between animals and, for example, their microbiomes. Okay? Yes? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it does say that it's on. Yeah, is it? Maybe I can raise it a little bit. OK, are we OK? All right. And if you can't hear me, just give me the high sign, um, please. Um, and so we are in a time in which we're able to sort of frame our ideas and our questions in new ways with new tools and new perspectives. And that is changing the landscape itself. Um, and so this makes it a wonderful time to be studying symbioses and a wonderful time to be returning to those symbioses that perhaps we thought we knew very well, such as lichen symbioses, and thinking about them in new ways. Um, and so I'm going to amend my little statement up there just a little bit to say that this is a wonderful time to be studying fungal symbioses. Um, and in doing so, I just want to um, highlight two quick photos before I go any further. Um, and one is from my first uh, trip to Michigan um, for, uh, for research purposes. I had the really great honor of visiting to give a presentation here um, earlier in this century. 
Um, but in 2014, um, I was able to uh, do some work up in uh, Ives Lake in the Upper Peninsula in a beautiful area that I'd never visited before. Um, and took some undergraduates and a team up there and actually got to interact with some of the ferns um, that were of interest to Herb, which meant a lot to me. And in thinking about this sort of situation, as we're thinking about fungal symbioses, when we look at all of the eukaryotes that we can see in this picture, okay, what we're seeing is effectively a set of extended phenotypes. Okay, we're seeing these eukaryotic organisms expressing traits that are derived in part through their microbial symbionts and in part in the plants here through their fungal symbionts. Um, and I think a little bit um, about this beautiful picture that, that Tim shared with me of uh, Florence and Herb um, actually getting up close and personal with the plants. And it reminds me that when we're looking at this sort of landscape, each one of these plants is itself an extension of the fungal symbioses inside. And so we would not be able to sort of do effective work on symbioses without the incredible work of categorizing, organizing that plant diversity, naming it, archiving it, and then providing us with the tools to do the natural history that we now do. So all that is to say that this is a great time to be studying fungal symbioses with plants. Um, and we're in a time in which um, our perspectives in ecology and evolution are changing um, through what we're learning from fungi. We're beginning to disentangle intricate interactions as between this trogocytid beetle and its yeast endosymbionts that change what it's capable of eating, natural conditions. Okay? And together, our new tools, new initiatives, and new approaches are helping us address some fundamental questions. And I just wanted to give you an overview <laughs> of what my lab does. So basically, my lab does the stuff um, in the brown box to address the questions or the insights that are in the blue box. Basically, we're interested in how organisms change, move, and diversify over time. We're interested in how natural and agricultural systems function and how they respond to change, how genomes work in the context of symbiosis, and then finally, fundamental discovery, basically the botanical floristics uh, in the mycological world to discover Earth's untapped biological, genetic, and chemical diversity. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about the uh, diversity of fungi. So many of you in the room will know that fungi are incredibly diverse. Um, somewhere between 69,000 and 100,000 species. I've actually heard fabulous mycologists argue this number to great detail over beer. Um, and what I would say is, yes, we've described a lot of fungal species. Many of them are the charismatic macro fungi, the fungi with big, glorious fruiting bodies that we can see at a safe distance, right? They're really attractive. Um, however, the vast majority of them are going to be the micro fungi, fungi with microscopic fruiting bodies. These are the ones that get my heart beating fast. These are the molds. These are the ones that my mom sometimes says, why did you do all of that schooling to study mold of all things, right? Um, and I try to persuade her that it's more than just like the stuff in the back of the fridge, but we're, we're working on that. Um, and so uh, when we sort of think about fungal diversity, um, even though we have sort of a set number of roughly a range of how many species have been described so far, Okay, um, we think that somewhere out there, there's a range between 1.5 million and 9 million species of fungi on the planet. So that is a tremendous number of species waiting to be discovered. And I, I would argue that most mycologists are sort of comfortable with that middling number of 5.1 million species. We're all sort of like semi-conservative internally about not wanting to overstate our amazing organisms. And so yeah, 5.1, that's in the middle, so it's safe, right? Um, so that's sort of maybe where we are. Um, and so the question is then, where are the missing fungi? That is the disparity between uh, what we have described so far and what we think is out there. Um, basically, these are cryptic microfungal symbionts. Cryptic because they're hard to see in nature, okay? And microfungal because they produce microscopic fruiting bodies, okay? And symbionts living in close association with other species. So let's think a little bit then about plant symbiotic fungi, in particular microfungi. Um, and so when we think about fungi that are associated with plants, okay, we have those that occur on leaf surfaces. And so these would be epiphyllous or epiphytic fungi. Right? Um, we have those that cause overt disease, so things that manifest functionally a pathogenic lifestyle. And then mycorrhizal fungi associated with the roots. Right? So those are probably the functional groups with which many of us are most familiar. So as Tim said, my research program has focused on endophytes. Uh, endophytes, um, it's sort of a fun term. This is a term that is really hard to define if you look at the literature um, because what exactly an endophyte is has been hard to pin down. But for the purposes of our talk today, we're going to define these as fungi that live within apparently healthy plant tissues without causing overt harm to their hosts. So we're talking about inside, not outside. We're talking about not overtly harmful, so non-pathogenic, at least at the time that they're studied. And for the purposes of this talk, 
we're going to focus on those endophytes that occur in above ground plant tissues. So leaves and stems, basically the photosynthetic organs. So leaving aside the beautiful world of mycorrhizae and the roots and focusing on the above ground tissues. Okay? So let me just give you a little bit of background on uh, endophytes and then we'll move in to the meat of the talk. So the poster child of endophyte biology is um, depicted here. Um, and here we have an example of a cool season grass. So endophytes of the cool season grasses are historically the best studied endophytes. They are not especially diverse. Okay? They represent a single family in the phylum Ascomycota. Okay? They are vertically transmitted, so they move from generation to generation by growing into the developing propagules. They grow systemically throughout the above ground tissues, okay? and they produce important secondary metabolites. So we might go back to that picture of um, Herb and Florence in the grasses there, and imagine that those grasses are full of these particular types of endophytes. Okay? And it's actually their metabolite production that led to their discovery. Okay? Um, and in fact, we can go back to over 100 years ago, 1902, okay, detecting the presence of these fungi in seeds of particular grasses, and the symptoms that those fungi cause have been recognized worldwide for a long period of time. The case in which grazing man mammals become ill after eating endophyte infected grasses. And in that case, the grasses often have names like drunk grass or sleepy grass. That's not referring to the grass itself, but to the alkaloids produced by the endophytes inside the grass. Okay? Um, and in fact, this brushes up against human history in the idea that the Salem witches um, perhaps had uh, ingested some of these alkaloids in the process of producing bread, and that that explained their aberrant behavior. Okay? So um, endophytes in grasses and in grains have been recognized for quite some time. But um, with Herb's appreciation for ferns and other plants, we recognize that not all plants are grasses. Um, and this is one of our field sites in Hawaii where we've got a mix of seed-free vascular plants, including ferns here, um, a large number of woody plants, and so on. And what's interesting is that those basic rules about endophytes, vertically transmitted, not very diverse, growing systemically, they don't necessarily hold once we move outside of the grasses. Okay? And in particular, I want to show you a figure that changed my life. We were talking in Tim's lab meeting today about aha moments, and this was a figure that um, totally inspired me. And so let me just show you what it is. This is a figure from a paper in 1996, and what we're seeing is one leaf of a tropical tree. That leaf has been cut into panels, and each of these small rectangles here is one millimeter by two millimeters. That leaf was surface sterilized, so there's no microbial presence, at least culturable, on the surface. Okay? And each pattern corresponds to a different fungus growing out of that leaf piece. So each of these one millimeter by two millimeter pieces, it's about that size if you put your fingers together, had effectively a different fungus growing out of it. And close by pieces had fungi that had been separated by millions of years at least of evolution. So how incredible is it that in a single leaf we might have this number of species, including some that couldn't be identified, okay, and including others that were uh, perhaps never known to have an endophytic lifestyle before. Okay? This was the first time that a figure like this had been shown, and what it meant to me was that in my own interests at the time, studying plant herbivore interactions and plant pathogen interactions, I needed to reframe that to think about the presence of all of these fungi inside. Okay? Um, and so, my goal in my research program is to try to scale up from individual leaves to a perspective that allows us at a global scale to ask what are the distributions of these fungi? Okay, what are the evolutionary origins of endophytes occurring within healthy plant tissue? What are their ecological modes? What do they do? And then finally, how can we explore plant evolution in the context of these extended phenotypes when the plants have endophytes inside? So those are the main themes of my research. And um, good news, we're finally to my title slide. I hope everyone's in for the next four hours because I'm ready. Uh, so I'm just kidding. We're going to move pretty efficiently. Um, and so um, my uh, title here um, is sort of centering on the idea of moving from a leaf perspective to a landscape perspective on this symbiotic renaissance dude. Um, and hopefully, um, we'll be able to explain what I mean by those beautiful mosaics that we just saw. Um, our transition to megabases, and then finally, um, the idea of Russian nesting dolls. And I realize we probably shouldn't talk about Russia <laughs> these days, because <laughs> um, we're potentially under their control, but um, mostly um, <laughs> we'll see why. Okay, so 
So let's um, also just take a moment. This is a picture from one of my field sites. Um, and this is from the uh, boreal zone. Um, these are species that actually occur in small areas in northern Michigan um, once you're up around the Ives Lake area. And what we see is that we have uh, lichens here. Okay? We have mosses and we have vascular plants occurring in a tiny area. And hopefully one message that you'll walk away with is that everything green here is the host to endophytic fungi. And that when we have an area of this size, we can easily find 100 species that are culturable, even in these locations that are far north. Okay? All right, so with that then, um, let's think a little bit about the map of where we've worked. Um, and um, I say a global perspective, but we're not going to get there quite today. Um, instead, I'm going to focus very much like the World Series focuses um, only on a portion of the world. Um, I'll be talking about a portion of the world as well. Um, and I just want to highlight that most of my work has been done within this sort of orange box on the land that we see. Um, but we have current projects now that are getting us um, outside of that box to locations worldwide. Um, and that's been a real pleasure. So over the last 20 years or so, I've had the opportunity to basically do endophyte discovery um, in all of the places that are shown with stars here. And so that means going from um, the farthest north that we've been, about 65 degrees north, um, to points uh, approaching the equator at about 9 degrees north. And in each of these sites, we've been able to do extensive collections, including both culturing these endophytes from plant tissue and using next generation methods to basically get at what's in there but we can't culture easily. Okay? Um, and so just to give you a sense of our sampling, um, this is one depiction of the green tree of life where we're looking at um, plants uh, and uh, the uh, affiliated green algae phylogenetically. And I just want to show you that we've tried to sample in our sampling across that green tree of life. So basically, for example, you can see that we've sampled tropical, temperate, and boreal and arctic representatives here of the asterid lineage, about 30 plant species, um, here in the rosids, about 30 plant species, and so on. So a phylogenetic breadth with some special targets that we've recently satisfied, which is um, exciting to us. Um, and uh, in doing this, let me just tell you a little bit about how we go out and get the endophytes in the first place from these healthy plants in the environment. So um, we come from an ecological background. We like replication and nested sampling structures and all that stuff. Um, and so basically what we do is that we have three separate microsites in each locality. And we go in and sample uh, 10 plant species that are representative of that community, sampling as much phylogenetic breadth as we can. Okay. Um, we subsample those leaves into those two millimeter segments, just like you saw in the mosaic figure. And we surface sterilize them to remove any culturable microbes from the outside. Um, we then place little pieces of those leaves on a growth medium and allow fungi to grow out. Um, and so this is, I'll refer to later, a very amenable technique for training junior scientists. It's something that we really enjoy doing with high school students, for example, to engage them in microbiology, sterile technique, fungal discovery, and so on. Okay, so we get these beautiful fungi growing out. We isolate them into pure culture, and then we characterize them. Um, when we're putting those pieces uh, onto a medium, we use a standard medium all around the world that encourages the greatest diversity of these fungi. And this is malt extract auger. It works really well. Um, and then finally, we always test some of these leaf segments to make sure that we're focusing on what's inside, not what's outside, because we're really interested in the intimacy of that association. Okay? Um, and so let me just show you um, why we incubate these little leaf segments for up to a year in our lab. That's a long time. Um, in part, that's because we're usually behind in processing our collections. Um, anyone who does field work knows that the joy of the field leads to many collections, and then the reality of the lab creates many years. <laughs> and so um, we often are a little behind in processing. But we also note that by keeping these in culture for up to a year, we often get some really interesting fungi. So let me just show you here why that's the case. Um, this is the percent of isolates that we get in culture from leaves of black spruce. Okay. These were collected um, in northern boreal forest as a function of months in culture. And yes, yeah, so that first month we get a lot of stuff. Right? It drops off dramatically. But we almost, whoops, my goodness, we almost always find some really interesting fungi, slowly growing, phylogenetically interesting, chemically intriguing, that appear after 10, 11 months in culture. So the fact that we're behind is our, to our benefit in discovering some of these interesting fungi that just for whatever reason don't grow as aggressively in culture. All right, um, and so I just wanted to draw your attention then um, on our phylogeny here to the green algae and comment that for someone like me from Arizona, there aren't a lot of places we can readily find lots of green algae in terrestrial systems, except in the context of lichen symbioses. Um, and what's wonderful is that if you take a lichen 
and you surface sterilize it and you cut it into little pieces, out will grow fungi. And those fungi are something that we refer to as endolichenic fungi. So let me just show you. Here we're looking at two uh, example lichens. Okay? Here is a cross-section of a representative lichen. In our typical lichen, we have the mycobiont, the fungus that forms the lichen phallus. We have the photobiont, the photosynthetic partner. And when that piece is sterilized on the surface and cut up and allowed to grow on an agar medium, we see many endolichenic fungi growing out. So we've introduced two terms here, endophytes inside plants, endolichenics inside lichens. And typically, in some of our most extreme environments, we get many more cultures coming out of these lichens than we do even from the plants in the same environments. Okay? So when we're sampling our green algae then, we're doing that in the context of lichens. Um, and actually, when you microdissect these lichen pieces, you can see these endolichenic fungi growing in very close association with the algal photobionts. So they're very interesting to us. Um, and we've now sampled more than 85 species. Um, there will be a test on this next figure. I hope everyone can read it really well. Um, basically, all I want you to walk away with here is that very much like we've sampled a phylogenetic diversity of plants, we've sampled a phylogenetic diversity of lichens as well. And that's what's shown here. And then we can also see that our sampling includes um, sort of big leafy lichens, the fruticose lichens, and then crustose lichens. And they all have these things. Okay. So um, for the convenience uh, of the rest of the talk, I'll refer to everything as endophytes, and please use that inclusively to mean endolichenic and endophytic fungi. Okay? So um, why do we culture? Uh, for me, it's because of this. Um, this is the profound joy that I feel when I see these organisms in culture for the first time. And in many cases, I think that we might be among the first people sort of nutty enough to go into these places to look for endophytes. So uh, about 95% of our endophytes have been estimated potentially to be new species of fungi. And that is a lot to keep us busy. I also sort of um, liken this to um, a stained glass window in a church. I think it's beautiful. And I find these organisms to be really compelling. We keep them um, in living uh, cultures um, at the University of Arizona. And as of this week, our total is now that we have um, over 62,000 of these uh, growing in culture um, available for public use, accessioned at the Gilbertson Herbar Herbarium, um, and more than 40,000 of them that are now sequenced for at least two loci. Um, and basically, we use ribosomal DNA markers that are affiliated with barcoding for fungi, and then also some protein coding genes. Um, for those who are interested, these have sort of typical genome sizes for the phylum of fungi that represent the Ascomycota, and large genomes associated with complex lifestyles that include free living stages. So these don't appear to be obligate endosymbionts. They often can do other things. Um, and we're really interested in those other things that they do uh, and why they do them. So um, what do my students and I do with these uh, beautiful organisms once we have them? Um, we uh, do uh, alpha taxonomy. Bravely, proudly, gladly, um, we name these um, and organize them. We're just in the process of uh, submitting a number of species descriptions based on the few that will actually produce fruiting structures and culture for us. Okay. Um, as Tim alluded to, we're also interested in understanding how they interact with host plants. So this is a picture actually from my dissertation work. This is a little baby, baby cacao tree, a little Theobroma cacao, a uh, chocolate tree. And it's been raised under sterile conditions. So one great thing about these endophytes is that they are not vertically transmitted. They are spread horizontally. You can spread them from one plant to another as spores rain down on leaves. So you can raise seedlings without endophytes, and you can introduce pathogens to those seedlings, and you can introduce endophytes to those seedlings and see what the outcomes are. And what we're seeing here is a seedling that has received seven species of endophytes and a pathogen with subsequently almost no damage and the same seedling in a leaf that received no endophytes but the pathogen and has extensive damage. So we've started to understand that these endophytes are really important for plant health. Um, and this has allowed us then um, to expand to sort of a sustainable agriculture approach, basically trying to grow local endophytes in rainforest remnants and applying them to small land holding cacao um, as a way to effectively protect the cacao industry in these forest remnants and therefore give value to the forests um, that are remaining. Um, and so um, in doing so, um, we've uh, applied this a little bit in biological control, um, developing a method where basically you can use river water and rice, feed that to your fungus, and then spray that onto um, your cacao fruits. So it's very effective. Um, and this um, finally has advanced beyond the very basic work that I did as part of my dissertation um, through the work of collaborators and a postdoc who's just finished his time in my lab. Um, and what they're doing is taking the very much needed metatranscriptome approach 
to understand the nature of the interactions between the endophytes and the plants. Um, and it's exciting to me because they're doing this in a, a way that will allow them to ask, does the plant respond to a pathogen in the same way it responds to a closely related endophyte? Um, that work is not being done in cacao, but instead in the sort of woody plant workhorse, um, which is Populus trichocarpa. Um, and so that work will be forthcoming, and I'm really excited to, to have them share it in the future. The next thing that we're really interested in is trying to understand the life cycle of these fungi. So um, I work with a really talented student, Yuling Huang, um, who is, among many things, a fabulous microscopist. This sort of tr traditional art is uh, an incredible talent, and she's really very skilled at it. Um, and so she's able to look, for example, at plant stomates that have been uh, imaged here in the context of inoculation with spores of endophytes. And over time, she watches these spores germinate um, and in some cases interact in really beautiful ways with stomatal openings on leaves. Um, in some cases, we zoom in. Um, poor Yuling, because I'm like, let's see it again. <laughs> How do we get it closer? Um, and in some cases, even having little fiestas here um, at the stomatal openings. And so understanding how this inoculation process goes and uh, what leads to the directionality of growth of these germinating fungal propagules is very interesting to us. Okay? Um, and then finally, I've alluded to, and Tim kindly mentioned, our interest in, in outreach. Um, and one way that we do this is through thinking about functional traits. And so um, little did you know that you would come to the, the Wagner lecture this year and hear about a high school science project. Um, but uh, we're going to hear about that just for a moment because I want to highlight a student we worked with, Frankie Orozco. Um, so Frankie is a student at a local high school, and he came and joined us to do a series of assays basically asking, given that these are horizontally transmitted fungi, they're landing on plant leaves, they're penetrating into those leaves, probably they're producing enzymes that allow them to do that, right? And so he looked at cellulase and ligninase enzymes, and here's one of his assay plates where what we're looking at is a plate in which the medium contains cellulose, and we've stained it so that the fungus growing here has this little halo around it. That halo is the area of clearing of cellulase activity. And so he was able to measure that cellulase or cellulolytic activity. And he found a really cool pattern um, that I wanted to share. And that is this. So when we look at endophytes in a species from Arizona, and we compare the same genotype of endophytes okay, from leaves and twigs, we see that they differ dramatically in their cellulase activity. So here's our cellulase activity. And we see that those from the leaves are way more capable of breaking down cellulose than those from the twigs. Okay. Otherwise, they seem to be genetically identical, what's going on. So please bear that in mind, because we're going to come back to it at the end of the talk. We finally figured it out, and it took us a long time, and we're really excited about it. But I just wanted to highlight that we developed um, a protocol for engaging um, students interested in STEM um, in uh, the plant microbiome and its uh, chemical products. And this was um, published a few years ago um, in 2012. Um, and it includes, if you go online, a 75-page manual for everything from recruiting students to making media to um, going through the assays and so on. Um, and we've, we were really pleased to do this. And we've implemented this now um, with our local high school students um, in the Tucson Mountains. Um, and then finally, in working with tribal colleges as well um, in uh, northern Arizona with Diné College, the tribal college of the Navajo people. So that's a little bit about what we do. Um, and uh, I hope that you'll see the, the connectivity that I feel with the inspiration that, that um, Herb Wagner uh, put forward um, in discovering these organisms, organizing their diversity, and making them accessible to other researchers, um, which matters a lot to us. OK, so let's talk then a little bit about the biology of these organisms and kind of what's interesting about them. Um, and so um, we are feeling um, kind of excited in this like biome naming world where everything is a biome, there's a microbiome, and, and so on. We've taken to calling this the global endobiome, but I think it's a little obnoxious. So please like, let that slide if it's a little much. Um, and basically, there are four main themes that I'm going to talk about um, in, in the rest of the talk. Um, the distributions of these fungi, their evolutionary origins, their ecological roles, and extended phenotypes. So going back to the list that we discussed. Okay? So let's start a little bit with distributions. And what you can see here is just a sampling of our sites going from the tropics to Nome, Alaska. Um, including, um, I just want to highlight, uh, this is what most of us think of when we think of Arizona, um, but that's also Arizona. So come on out and visit sometime. Um, it actually can be quite lush and, and lovely too. Um, okay, and so over the next few slides, what I'm going to do is that um, each slide is going to have a code at the top, 1A, 1B, 1C. 
And each of those is the main message of the slide. So if you're not in the mood to look at lots of graphs, read that top line and you will get the key point, okay? Now hopefully we're gonna get it, we'll see. So um, the first thing that I wanna point out is that when we started this work, we didn't know anything about the distribution of these organisms. So we went to these sites, did the sampling that I described and tried to understand where are they distributed around the world? How abundant are they? How diverse are they? And who are they? So let's talk first about isolation frequency. This is the percent of those little leaf pieces that gives us an endophyte in culture. If it's 100%, every piece gives us an endophyte. Okay? <coughs> and so what we see is that there was a strong latitudinal gradient in isolation frequency. The data that I'll show you come from 66 plant species and site combinations, all major lineages of land plants, 42 plant families, and about 40,000 little tiny leaf segments. And so let me show you also that our sampling here goes from angiosperms to mosses and pretty much everything in between, um, including our lichens. Okay? So a latitudinal gradient, what does it look like? So on the y-axis here, we have isolation frequency, and on the x-axis, we have latitude. So as we go from the tropics okay, to the boreal zone in Arctic, we see this pattern. Lots of endophytes per leaf okay, to relatively few. Let's remember that here we're only talking about what we can culture. And so there's the missing piece of what might be unculturable. And how to assess the abundance of those is kind of tricky. Um, so we're just going to talk about the culturable ones for now. Now, um, as an ecologist then, I started thinking, okay, latitude is not really a thing unto itself. I mean, it, it tells us where we are on the planet. But really what we want to look at are the um, traits of the locations or the plants. So we see that this pattern can be um, broken down to help us understand what's really going on. If we start thinking about local plant density, when we think about tissue age, host lineage, and abiotic factors, each one of these has some explanatory power that underlies this global pattern. Okay? But that's what we've seen so far. So that's the first key point. Lots more endophytes bang for the buck when we're in the tropics, fewer when we go farther north. Okay? Second, what about diversity? So um, also we see a latitudinal gradient of diversity. I just want to tell you that the data I'll show you come from all major plant lineages, 42 plant families, uh, more than 8,000 ITS LSU sequences, again, this sort of barcode locus for fungi, um, and about 2,000 endophyte species. And that's what we see here. On the y-axis, we have a measure of diversity called Fisher's Alpha. Okay? And if you don't know Fisher's Alpha, all you need to know is that that's really low and that's really high. And so as we go from the tropics to the far north, we see we go from a high diversity to a lower diversity. So plants in the tropics get more infections by more diverse fungi. Okay? All right. Um, once again, we can start explaining this with a bunch of underlying factors. Okay? And so one question that we might have is, all right, um, when we're looking at this sort of pattern, what, what do we really want to get at here? Okay? And so it's interesting that we are, of course, traversing a tremendous distance in terms of rainfall and temperature as we move across that range. Okay? And so in this environment also, plant communities differ in their diversity. Okay? So are we simply seeing that these are more diverse plant communities and that's given rise to more diverse endophytes? And these are less diverse plant communities, so fewer species of endophytes? These are reasonable questions. So we've looked at that. And that leads us to our third point. What we found is that endophyte diversity doesn't simply track plant diversity. Okay? And so let me show you the evidence that we have for that. We have a total of four graphs that are going to show up here. On the left here, what we see is Fisher's alpha, again, that diversity measure. Okay? We have local host richness. Okay? And here, we have a data set for endolichenic fungi, and here, endophytes and plants. And I have yet to be able to come up with a strong pattern from those data, except basically a flat line. Okay? So it's not just plant diversity that is mattering okay, at our local scale or at a regional scale, at the scale of about 500 kilometers. So it's not just that. What else is going on? Well, if we map our total number of sampling sites now um, against abiotic factors, rainfall and temperature, we start to see some interesting patterns that are not explained by plant diversity alone. And so here you can see sort of the intensity of our sampling. And we can also see some strong patterns. So here we see diversity of endolichenic fungi, diversity of endophytes as a function of mean annual temperature. And we see a strong relationship with warmer temperatures giving us more diverse communities. Okay? So that's sort of nice. I live in the desert. It's very hot. There's lots of diversity there. Um, for those who are interested, um, for uh, the models that we've run, precipitation um, also matters in an interaction term for endolichenics. 
and independently for endophytes. So um, it's been really interesting to us to start to separate host communities from abiotic factors. Those are obviously interlinked, but when we separate them statistically, we have explanatory power coming from temperature and uh, rainfall. And so um, what's nice um, is that when we have endophyte diversity tracking abiotic factors, um, I've had um, a wonderful group of students uh, begin to explore this. Um, and so Chuzo Oita in my lab right now is looking at environment by plant defense interactions that change along these abiotic gradients. Yuling Huang is looking at biogeography and disturbance, in particular wildfire, and how that can really change uh, and reset endophyte communities. And Liz Bowman is interested in climate and soil <coughs> and how those relate to endophyte communities. All right, so um, the next thing that I want to talk about um, is the following, and that is this difference between phylogenetic richness and species richness, okay? So species richness then is just the number of species that we see, right, and we often use that to mean diversity. Here, I'm gonna use the term phylogenetic richness just to mean the number of major lineages of fungi that we see, okay? So we've all just decided that the data suggest that species richness and diversity is highest in the tropics. What about phylogenetic diversity? So here's another way to depict our species richness. This is the number of species, okay, for a random set of 200 isolates that we pull out of a bag, okay? And what we can see is that in our tropical semi-deciduous forest, okay, we find, okay, looks like about 70-ish, 75 species in that 200 sample that we pull out, okay? If we do the same thing with a pool from temperate semi-deciduous forest with the same sort of sampling approach, we find fewer. And then finally, if we get in boreal forest and arctic tundra, we find fewer still. So this is the species richness pattern. The black is the observed value, and the red is a confidence interval around it. Okay? So how does that match up with phylogenetic diversity? Actually, phylogenetic diversity goes the other way. Okay? So instead of more diversity in the tropics, we actually see a pattern that hopefully will make any Michiganders happy, um, and that is a tremendous amount of phylogenetic diversity as we move farther north. And so what we can see here are pie charts. And if you don't know these fungal names, don't worry about it. These are classes of fungi. And all I want you to walk away with is the following. In the tropics, the vast majority of the endophytes we find are members of a group called the Cerdariomycetes. And there are two other main groups, Dothidiomycetes and other Ascomycota Eurotiomycetes. As we go to the boreal zone, we find that the prevalence of those Cerdariomycetes has dropped, okay? And we find that this other Ascomycota is much richer. So our phylogenetic richness is much greater. So sort of the take home message is that if we sample in the tropics, we're gonna get lots of species, but they're gonna be in a few phylogenetic lineages. And if we sample in the far north, we're gonna get lots of different phylogenetic lineages and a few species in each. Okay? And so that's been really instructive to us to try to understand how these might be interacting and what their origin might be with these plants. So I mentioned that we've started to expand our scope a little bit. And here I just want to highlight some of our work that was done through the NSF Dimensions of Biodiversity program. We've just finished all of the field work and lab work associated with our sampling in the sites shown um, in pink. So we had two sites in Russia, um, in Sweden, um, in here, um, northern Michigan, in Quebec, um, in northern Alberta, and Alaska. Okay. Um, and sometimes these stars are a little bit deceiving, so let me convey to you my enthusiasm for what we do by showing you what we actually did in Quebec. Um, so that pink star could be expanded to this. Um, this is a 900-mile transect that we did in triplicate in a float plane um, going from the end of the roads here uh, to the furthest north extent of boreal forest, where basically it's the tree limit. Um, and these were spaced at approximately 100-mile intervals. Um, we would f land, get out and collect, get back in the plane, land on the next lake, get out and collect, go on again and again. We also did an east-west transect along a single line of latitude. And in doing this, we had sites that were uh, doubling distance one to the next. Okay? So here we can look at geographic turnover as a function of distance, and here geographic turnover as a function of environment. Okay? Um, and so just to give you a sense of what we spanned, this was our southernmost site. Okay? Here's an intermediate site. And here's our northernmost site. Um, and uh, we have these portable little sterile hoods that we flew around with that allowed us to do this work in the field. Um, we brought back uh, thousands of cultures um, and many samples for next generation sequencing. Um, and all of this work has been led in the laboratory by Jenna Yuren, who was a postdoc on this project. And I just want to show you one thing that she found that really meant a lot to us. And that is that when we're going to um, any of those places, it's not like we get to go back next year and see if we got it right. Um, we have to assume that and hope that when we go in and sample, our snapshot is an accurate depiction of what's actually there. So we were fortunate in that um, we were able to return to a site 
in Alaska near Fairbanks um, and repeat our sampling in exactly the same place in two different years. We did this in 2008 and 2011, years that were very different in terms of uh, environmental conditions. 2008 was still snowy and cold. It was late summer in 2011. We went back to that same site and we asked, are the endophyte communities the same at these two different time points? Our fingers were really, really, really crossed um, because we hoped so. The good news is yes, there was no significant difference in the communities. And I want to show you the evidence for that here. So what we're seeing here is a non-metric multidimensional scaling plot, NMDS. And each one of our samples here is color coded according to the year in which we sampled. Okay? Our red are the 2008, and each one of these is the community of endophytes in a particular host, and blue 2011 communities in those same hosts. They overlap very nicely. There is no significant difference. We looked at this with many different levels of stringency and so on, and we were really happy to see that our snapshots seem to be representative of what's there. OK? So um, another thing that Jenna's work showed us um, was that we were able to start to pick out some really strong geographic dif differences in these communities. And so here we're looking at one of my favorite um, hosts. This is uh, Cladonia, um, growing with mosses, as it always does. And when we look at the endolichenic fungi associated with Cladonia in North Carolina, Florida, Quebec, and Alaska, we can see that these separate out really nicely. Again, these are only cultures, and they're color-coded just to show us vividly these different locations. So what this basically is telling us is that when we have a relatively widespread host, at least at the genus level, we tend to have relatively narrowly distributed symbionts. So that's exciting, too, because it tells us that basically everywhere we go, we can find new fungi. Okay. So um, for a, a brief moment, um, sort of a shout out to um, the tradition of phylogenetics that, that Herb's work really helped us um, achieve. Um, for those who have worked on fungi, you know that one of the challenges we have is that the barcode locus that we use isn't really alignable at broad phylogenetic scales. It makes it really hard to do a phylogenetic analysis of the fungi we find in a given place. Okay? And so we end up with alignments like this that really are not informative. And so one thing that our dimensions team did was to develop some methods for building in um, constraints to these phylogenies that allow us to always keep the backbone true and then ornament the tips with these endophytes. Um, and other methods that have allowed us to depict uh, entire communities using bioinformatic tools as phylogenetic trees okay, that actually do represent our current understanding of the known species. And so let me just show you an example there, and hopefully that will sort of clarify what I mean. So what we're looking at here is a phylogenetic reconstruction of the phylum Ascomycota. Okay, this is the most species-rich group of, of fungi, and it's the group that contains the majority of endophytes. We have the different classes Okay, um, or subphyla around the edges. Okay. And what we can see is that some of the tips here are black. Those are known species, okay. and we know where they should go. So there are ways to make sure that our method is working appropriately. Okay. We then can see color coding according to where our sampling was done. And some of you may not be able to see that with the monitor here, but we have brown for the Arctic, blue for Alaska, darker blue for Quebec, North Carolina, Arizona, whoops, Florida, um, and some tropical sampling. Okay. And so you can see right away that there are some clades that are primarily uh, Floridian, okay? and others, anytime you've got a blue bar sticking out there, it's primarily boreal. It's from the far north. And so what this allows us to do then is to say, OK, given that phylogenetic diversity of boreal endophytes, did they all arise from one lineage and then diversify? Okay. And the answer appears to be no. What we see is that all of these lineages have potentially colonized the boreal zone potentially with the advance of plants and the retreat of glaciers. And it gives us a chance to start to think of that in a biogeographic framework, um, which is exciting for us. Okay? So lots of endophytes in the boreal zone here represented in lots of different places. So let me just show you one last result from our culture-based work. And that is that when we zoom in on some of those clades, we can see some really clear representation of geographic structure at the clade level. So <coughs> these are two classes of the Ascomycota. And again, here's our color coding for the location. And we see these cases again and again of what appears to be local diversification. Okay? So we have lineages that in an area diversify among many different hosts. Okay? And then as we go to the next area, we find another local diversification. So it's not just these species themselves that are different in these different places, but they connect to evolutionary lineages that differ from place to place as well. Okay, within each of these classes. Okay, so I said that I was going to focus um, almost entirely on culturing, but I just want to highlight that um, our culture-free work 
has recapitulated some of the patterns that we've seen. And that's been really exciting to us. When we can work with only the stuff we culture, we worry maybe we're missing a tremendous portion of the fungal community. So um, Jana's work, okay, in particular, along this north-south transect, and here you see our triplicate sort of sampling, okay, has shown us um, through uh, integrating our mean annual temperature information and other environmental fa factors that mean annual temperature is actually a great predictor of community structure for these unculturable endophytes. And for those who are interested, um, here we're talking about um, millions of reeds from Illuminomyceae. Um, and this is a slightly different representation of a non-metric multidimensional scaling plot. But all you need to see is that in Picea, and in a moss pleurosium, okay, we have strong structure okay, according to how cold the site is. Um, and it's repeated in these two different hosts. So we're starting to see what we think is a general pattern. Okay? Um, also, just to highlight some of the work that Jenna has done, um, our work in the circumboreal forest belt um, has spanned the sites that I showed you on the flat map before. And here you can see the different colored stars. And I just want you to walk away with the fact that as we sample around that uh, broad latitudinal band around the planet, we also see um, strong geographic structure. Here's sort of our Sweden and Russia side. Here's our North American side. So different communi communities as we sample even related plants and lichens in these different places. Okay? All right. So um, we see some geographic structure at a global scale. Okay. So now um, what I'd like to do is sort of uh, in a rapid way move through the last few points of this talk. And that is that I just want to tell you a little bit about what we've learned about where did these fungi come from in the first place, okay? Um, and so a little bit about their evolutionary origins. So I, I, in a way I've been apologizing for the following slide for uh, several years because we've had multiple long analyses crash in the final stages. So we're actually going back in time and looking at a three gene analysis that I can tell you is recapitulated by some other work, but at the moment we only have the three gene analysis as opposed to a richer phylogenetic analysis. What are we looking at here? So this is, again, the phylum Ascomycota, and we're going here from the base of the tree okay, to the tips, and what we can see is that each lineage has been color-coded according to its ecological mode. So mycobionts forming the lichen phallus, okay? Pathogens, okay, shown in red, okay? Sapotrophs, decay fungi shown in brown, okay? Um, and our endolichenic and endophytic fungi shown in dark blue and pale blue. So what does this sort of analysis tell us? Well, let's zoom in on some of these clades and see. So what we can do is that in a tree like this, we can reconstruct ancestral states using various models. And when we do that, what we see is that we have, um, in this case, a clade that contains one tropical angiosperm inhabiting endophyte and a number of pathogens. And when we reconstruct the ancestral state in this very simple case, we have a pathogenic ancestor giving rise to an endophyte. When we look at this, this happens in about 63% uh, of transitions from pathogen. Anytime pathogen goes to something else, it goes to an endophyte. 63% of the time. We see very few cases of a saprotroph giving rise to um, an endophyte or a pathogen. Okay? And then finally, we have cases in which the ancestor is an endolichenic fungus, and that gives rise to endophytes very frequently. Okay? And in fact, 71% of the transitions from an endolichenic fungus are to an endophyte. So if we summarize across the tree in lots of different reconstructions and lots of uncertainty built in, we get a map that looks like this. Lots of exchanges over evolutionary time between endophytes and pathogens as life modes. Lots of transitions from endolichenic fungi to endophytes, but very few in the reverse. Okay. Transitions to saprotrophy more often than the reverse. Okay. So um, obviously, what excites us is why, like what's happening driving these. Um, and there are um, a few different um, points that I just want to bring up. One is that we can start to sort of look at the phenotypic traits um, using microarrays, phenotypic microarrays. The other is that we can take a genomic perspective. And let me just show you a little bit of what we've learned um, from these phenotypic microarrays. In particular, what we can do is we can take closely related uh, endophytes and saprotrophs and ask, given that they're closely related, do they share traits? Are they very similar? Or are they very different? Okay? Do this across lots of pairs of endophytes and saprotrophs and see what the patterns show us. So here's an example of what one of these plates might look like. Um, this is a biolog plate, and we have negative control and then lots of polymers, carbohydrates, carboxylic acids, and so on. And we can look at the ability of the fungus to use these and how effectively it uses them. Okay? So let me just show you in sort of a very general form what we found. So here we're looking at endophytes. And what we see is that our endophytes are really good at using carbohydrates. Okay? They're not quite as good at polymers. Um, and this is a growth measurement. 
When we take multiple pairs of closely related saprotrophs, what we see is that they actually do differ, and they differ markedly. They are much faster growing. They're much better at using carbohydrates. And across the board, they're better at using every substrate. So this gives us some idea that these ecological modes really are kind of different from one another, <coughs> and we're interested in why. This could reflect, for example, um, a loss of function or a gain of function when we see that endophytes okay, can only use 13 of those 95 substrates, and our saprotrophs are using basically half. Okay? So um, what's going on? Well, we could look at this genomically, and we are doing that. But also, we're interested in sort of the last piece of, of the story for today. And that is what's going on with these fungi in terms of the endosymbionts that they themselves harbor. Okay? Um, and it turns out that basically when we're looking at endophyte plant associations, we're looking at tripartite symbioses. These are fungi that consistently harbor endohyphal bacteria. And it's a little too bright in here for us to see, but hopefully you can detect that we have a, a fungal hypha here. And this has been stained using fish to show us bacterial uh, endosymbionts occurring within this living fungus. Okay? Um, this work was led by Michelle Hoffman in our group. Um, and when we started this, primar primarily the um, endohyphal bacteria that were known were known in Glomeromycota and Eucoromycotina, primarily in root-associated fungi. What Michelle did was that she started looking at lots of diverse endophytes from conifers in Arizona and North Carolina. And she found about 30% of our endophytes across every major group of the Ascomycota that we looked at had these bacteria inside. Okay? Um, and we found them in all of our host species and all the sites we looked at. And now our detection methods are better, and we're consistently seeing these in about 80% of our fungal cultures. So there's a lot um, going on from the bacterial perspective. So what we're interested in is the diversity of those bacteria. And these were the ones that were known when we started this work. Everything in bold okay, is an example of an endohyphal bacterium that we found in an endophytic fungus. So phylogenetically diverse. Okay? What's interesting as well um, is that we don't see any strict sense coevolution between fungal hosts and bacterial endosymbionts. And even if you don't know who these genera are, you can just see that we have um, repeated genera showing up in different places. These are fungal names. So we don't see a close one-to-one -one relationship between a given endohyphal bacterium and its fungal host. There's lots of host switching. Okay? We also know um, that when we start to look at these, these bacteria are really powerful in shaping fungal phenotypes. And I just want to draw your attention to the one that we've looked at most closely, which is a Pestilodiopsis fungus that harbors an endohyphal bacterium. And it's a Ludiobacter, um, for those who might know the group. So what's fun is that we can take these fungi, we can treat them with antibiotics, and we can remove the bacterium. And then we can look at the fungal phenotype in the presence and absence of the bacterium. And now we've been able to put the bacteria back in so we can basically recapitulate that original infected stage. And so when we do that, let me just show you some of the highlights of um, some of the work on this. Um, we see, for example, fungal growth under heat stress being strongly influenced in culture by the endohyphal bacteria. This is effectively growth. Okay? And here we see in the presence of the endohyphal bacterium and the absence, lots more growth at 36 degrees when the bacterium is there. Okay? Here, okay, this is production of indole 3 acetic acid, um, very important for plant growth. Much greater when the fungus contains its endohyphal bacterium, much lower when it's the fungus alone. Okay? And we can take those same uh, materials then and apply them to seedlings of tomato in this case. And we can see that when seedlings are treated with the products from the endohyphal bacterium plus the fungus, we get much larger seedlings than we do when they're treated with water, the growth medium, or the fungus alone. Okay? And so we've just sort of translated this to a series of inoculation experiments. Um, I have a thing for the Cupressaceae. They're one of my favorite families. Um, and they're also really wonderfully um, easy to inoculate with endophytes using these little hanging Eppendorf tubes. So we basically make a slurry of um, endophytes in sterile water, and we parafilm them onto branches, and we leave them there for 48 hours in nice warm temperatures, keep everything humid, pull them off, and then a few weeks later, we can go back and isolate endophytes from those branches. And when we do that, what we can see um, is shown here in a very preliminary data figure. This is isolation frequency in three plant species okay, when the same fungus has been applied without the endohyphal bacterium and with. So we're more frequently seeing that uh, positive infection when the bacterium is there. And so this work is being carried out um, through a new postdoc in the lab, Joe Spraker, um, two graduate students, Justin Schaefer and Emma Holland, and then I'm collaborating with Rachel Gallery uh, and Dave Baltris on this work. And now let's go back to Frankie and the high school project. So you guys remember this figure. 
So what we found was that these strains differed in their endohyphal bacterium. And that when we change the endohyphal bacterium, we totally changed the enzyme profile of the fungi themselves. So it was Frankie that sort of led us to want to investigate that. And it was work by a number of different students that helped us understand that it was the bacterial component that was important. So let me conclude. You guys have been a wonderfully patient audience with a lot of words. Um, basically, um, here's our Russian dolls, the final word in the first part of our title. And what we're seeing here then um, is that when we're thinking about a plant, okay, that plant occurs in an environment and in a location that together with the plant influence the endophytes that are present. I didn't show you much of our uh, evidence for host specificity and different endophytes in different plant lineages, but they matter. And those endophytes in interacting with the plant then are influenced by bacterium. So when we talk about an extended phenotype of a plant then, okay, that extended phenotype is reflecting the traits of that plant, for example, disease resistance, that can be influenced by the endophyte that in turn can be influenced by the bacterium inside. So my hope is that this will help us in nature start to think about functional plant traits from a slightly different perspective, integrating these invisible tripartite symbionts uh, into um, the system. So I hope that um, now, coming back to this slide, um, the symbiotic re renaissance uh, makes some sense as a theme. Um, classical ideas in a new light, new perspectives, new techniques, um, new methods, changing the landscape. And that's what the field of symbiosis research with plants is doing now, and it's a great time to be a part of it. Okay? So I'd just like to close um, with a picture of, of my lab. Um, we, we actually processed this after the election, um, shared it together. Um, and so this is the wonderful group of people with whom I work. I'm looking really painfully shy in the front. They made me stand in the front. Um, but if you want to learn more about us, um, our, our website is here, um, two other websites here, um, and our mycological herbarium is here. But more than anything, thank you so much for your attention. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, Vincent. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, so, that, so right now your pattern is in diversity, you know, if you have something you can like, see some other things. Yep. And it's mostly based on the culture one. Do you have any data whether culture ability is at all a function of, of, uh, of the gradients? Or not? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, like, does culture ability of the fungi differ along those gradients? So we're just analyzing that exactly now. And what we had to do was to come up with an index of culture ability. Um, and we did that by 